my name is Mark, and in this episode we'll be making fresh pasta, ricotta cheese and a parmesan crisp, and we'll be putting them together to make a nice plate of tortelloni. Fair warning, it's a bit of a project, so you might want to save this one for a weekend or when you have got a bit more time. Let's get cooking! We will start by making some fresh ricotta. There's some lemon juice involved, so zest the lemon, because the zest will always come in handy. Then slice your lemon in half and juice it. As far as cheese goes, ricotta is one of the easiest cheeses you can make. It only contains three ingredients, which are milk, lemon juice and salt. I actually checked my recipe against one that I had in a book, and as it turns out, I'm doing it all wrong, using only about half the lemon juice that's suggested. Almost any milk will do, but I would stay away from UHT because it won't work. And doing this with skim milk will give you really dry cheese, so whole milk is preferred. Warm up your milk in a pan, then start heating it up. Initially, stick a lid on it to make it heat up a bit quicker. You're going to want to take the lid off again at some point, but while there's condensation on the outside of the pan, the milk is still cool and you can just keep heating it. Once it is hot, add the acid. I think the book said something over 80 celsius, but as long as your milk is hot enough that it starts foaming, it should start curdling almost instantly after adding the lemon juice. Leave it to react for a while. At some point there should be a clear separation between the chunks, which are called curds, and the liquid, which is called whey. Once the curds and whey are fully separated, strain your cheese. You can totally use a cheesecloth for this if you really must, but the sieve works just fine and is much less of a hassle to clean. Then use the whey as you please. Use it as a liquid in pancakes or in sauces, or if you have any more interesting ideas, please leave them in the comments below. In this case, I ended up with roughly 423 grams of ricotta, so I added about 4.23 grams of salt to it. After mixing in the salt thoroughly, I refrigerated the ricotta for later use. If we're going to make pasta, we'll need some pasta dough. Typically this will use one egg per 100 grams of flour, which amounts to about 60% hydration as a baker's percentage. Those are pretty generous portions though. I typically end up using about 70 grams of flour per person eating. That's a bit of an issue, as it means I would need about an egg and a half when cooking for two. So ultimately, I end up using about 140 grams of flour, one egg and a little bit of water. We are after a fairly stiff dough. Although initially it will look a little bit on the dry side, just keep kneading it until your bowl is clean. Then cover it and leave it to relax in the refrigerator. In our filling we will be using some toasted pine nuts. So get some in a frying pan or skillet that can handle the heat, ideally not a non-stick. Then keep moving them around until they start browning. For sweetness we will also use a pear. Once this is prepped, let's get it all together. Put about 200 grams of your ricotta in a bowl along with the pear and pine nuts. We will also add some shredded spinach and basil. The reason for these is that ricotta and spinach is a classic combination. And pine nuts and basil together are often used to make pesto. To shred these leaves, simply roll them up tightly and then chop them into very fine strips. Of course, those go in the bowl as well. Finally, for some salty bursts of flavor, add some capers and give it all a quick mix. And with that, your stuffing is ready. Now we're getting to the core of the recipe, which is making the actual tortelloni. To do so, first we'll start by rolling out the dough. Whenever it starts taking up too much space, just slice it in half and keep rolling. It's helpful to keep rotating your dough and just roll away from the center. Whenever the dough sticks to your rolling pin, dust both the dough and the rolling pin with a bit of flour, then continue. Eventually, you will end up with one or more sheets of dough that are very thin, slightly translucent, and generally acting like a thin sheet of fabric. At that point, your sheet of dough is thin enough. Then we can cut out some circles. You can use a fancy pasta stamp if you have one, but it's just as effective to cut circles with an upturned mug, or a cookie cutter, or a spent tin of beans for all I care. Anyway, that's the sort of diameter you're looking for. Place your dough circles side by side on the plate if you can. If you stack them on top of each other, they're likely to stick. Roll out the leftover dough into new sheets and repeat. We can now start filling and folding our tortelloni. Grab a little dough circle, place about a teaspoon worth of filling in the center, wet the edges with a bit of water, then fold in half, pinching around the edges and working out any air pockets that might be in the middle. Then bring together the tips and pinch them together. And voila, you made a beautiful tortellone. 
All you need to do now is repeat. It helps to keep the filling under control with your thumb just before folding. Also make sure to pinch quite tightly. This helps to avoid your dumplings bursting later. Of course it doesn't always work. If your sheet tears while folding, just put the filling back in the bowl and recycle your dough into a new sheet. Place your finished tortelloni on a well floured plate to avoid them sticking. Refrigerate your tortelloni until you're ready to cook them. And don't worry if you've got some stuffing left. You can serve it by the side and it will just make your plate look prettier later on. Having just a plate of pasta would be a bit boring, so we're whipping up a mushroom sauce to go with it. If you cut your mushrooms in half before slicing them, they won't roll away and you'll be able to slice them more quickly. Once your mushrooms are sliced, get the pan on the hob with a bit of olive oil, then add a clove of chopped garlic. Also add a tablespoon of flour to the pan. Then add in some milk and give it a stir. The resulting bechamel will be the basis for our sauce. Add the mushrooms, a splash of white wine, and some herbs commonly used in Italian cuisine, such as rosemary, oregano and thyme. Give it another stir, have a taste and adjust the seasoning as necessary. Once it is bubbling away nicely, your sauce is done. Making the Parmesan crisp is barely a recipe at all, but I didn't want to keep it from you because it results in such a radical texture change with so little effort. Here is how it works. Finely grate some Parmesan or any hard aged cheese onto a plate. Then give the plate a little shake to evenly distribute the cheese that's on it. Microwave on full power for about 50 seconds to a minute. These timings will vary depending on your microwave. Finally, peel off the cheese from the plate with a knife before it crisps up. And that's all. Now that we've gone through all this effort, let's plate it up nicely. We'll start by putting a base of mushroom sauce on the plate. By giving the plate a wiggle, you'll end up with a nice circle of sauce to frame your food. Then put the tortelloni on top of there. This time around we made a full meal, but if this were a starter you'd probably just put three on there and arrange them nicely. Then let's give the plate a little bit of color with some leftover filling. Some basil doesn't go amiss either. Ideally I would have remembered to reserve some basil leaves, but I forgot. Then add your lemon zest and grate over some parmesan cheese. Finally, the parmesan crisp. Just putting it flat on top of there doesn't look very good, so I broke the crisp in two and allowed the two halves to support each other standing up, making for a little bit more dramatic presentation. At long last, dinner time is here. All that's left to do now is to nom. If you enjoyed this video, please do the usual clicky thing and I'll see you next time. Bye.